On this episode of Built to Last, we're going to be talking about sustainable building. With that, we're going to be meeting with three industry experts. We'll be talking about what it means, how it is managed, and what some solutions are. All that's coming up next on Built to Last. Hi, I'm Bruce Obora. The focus of this episode is sustainable building. With this, we're going to define what is the criteria, how is it measured, how it works, and what are some other terms and methods that are different from conventional work. I work as the executive director with the U.S. Green Building Council, the Illinois chapter, and have been working with the organization for about a year and a half and have always had a passion for architecture along with um, uh, concern and passion for the environment. Based in Washington, D.C., the Illinois chapter of the U.S. Green Building Council collaborates with the building industry working to promote buildings that are environmentally responsible, profitable, and healthy places to live and work. Sustainability in the built environment, um, there's been a lot of concern about you know, how our buildings have an impact on clean air, clean water, um, climate change. And so uh, how we build our buildings, it's a really big part of the solution to some of those problems. Sustainability, the ability to continue a defined behavior indefinitely. The Chicago Regional Council of Carpenters is leading the way in sustainable energy efficiency construction. The CRCC offers robust and industry-enhancing qualification and certification courses, resulting in a highly trained, skilled workforce changing how America designs, builds, and maintains residential and commercial structures. I am the Director of Sustainability Services, so I oversee the group of consultants that um, deliver our LEED certification projects. The sustainable design movement really is a shift from traditional building practices to more environmentally friendly um, and energy efficient practices. Um, and it really focuses on um, not just the design and construction of the building, but also the operations and maintenance of the building, as well as any renovations or deconstruction of the property as well. While the practice is decades old, today's emphasis on green building takes on a more urgent role given the fact that our natural resources are limited and our relationship to the environment is truly symbiotic. I work for CBRE and I'm a director in our Global Energy and Sustainability Group, which is a group that's specifically focused on sustainability solutions for our clients across all business lines, and creating a, a sustainable workplace. It, it is a standard for many corporations and, and design and construction firms as well. Um, you know, for example, in, in the city of Chicago, getting a LEED version 2009 certified rating is actually really easy. Our, our Chicago city codes already surpass those LEED baselines for energy efficiency. So the new version of LEED came out and, and that's what they're trying to do is, is push the market forward again because it has become kind of a normal thing. What's exciting about the sustainability movement is it touches on so many different professional fields and uh, industry sectors. You're combining the, the, the know-how that engineers bring to design professionals, to um, public health professionals, uh, to um, what government officials are doing, and all of that working together has a huge impact on the types of buildings that we live, work, and learn in. There's green, sustainable buildings everywhere. Oftentimes people don't even know that they maybe work in one, other than maybe there's a plaque that says it's lead rated. Um, so there's a lot all out there, but um, there's some really high profile examples of some great uh, green buildings.
My name is Doug Widener and I'm the Director of Community Advancement at the U.S. Green Building Council. The LEAD um, Green Building Rating System stands for Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. Focuses on a real comprehensive look at sustainability. So the greenest building is an existing building. So people think that you know you can only make a, a new building green, and certainly uh, building a new building sustainably is the way to go. But but there's things you can do throughout a building's life cycle to make it more sustainable. And in fact, you could design the greenest building in the world, but if you don't operate it and manage it uh, accordingly throughout its life cycle its design intent may not live up to, to reality. So with LEAD we talk about integrated design and that really focuses on bringing all the stakeholders together, the building owner, the occupants, the architects, the, the engineers, the contractors, anyone that's going to be using the building and really from the start looking at what are all the opportunities to build sustainably, uh, to, to design and build the most sustainable building. Durability is a, is a key key uh, factor and something called life cycle assessment when you really look at you know the, the complete impact of a product or an entire building from the first extraction of the resource, through manufacturing, through its um, installation in a building, and then what do you do with it um, once the, its, its useful life is, is passed. And so life cycle assessment looks at the entire environmental impact of, of a product, or again, a building, and then you make the, de you make the decision based on the lowest life, uh, the, the best life cycle assessment, the lowest impact of those materials. Chicago, there's the new method factory that just opened up. Um, it's going to be um, producing and manufacturing soap and other cleaning products, um, but they're going to do so um, by never using any water from the Great Lakes, um, by generating their own electricity, um, and having zero waste generated from the factory. Um, that's amazing. That has huge impacts, not just for the environment, um, but for um, method uh, economically. Um, it makes a lot of sense to uh, save um, on water and waste and electricity um, to help affect your financial bottom line. Municipalities across the country are updating their energy codes, their building codes, uh, and requiring companies that are either coming into the area or building new buildings or interior spaces to meet certain requirements. And almost all of them have some sort of green or sustainable sure. component to it. We've really found that depending on the phase of the life of the building that the building is in, if it's in design and construction, uh, it can be driven by ownership or by the architect. Um, and ownership we see is typically can be driven by the market demand for um, sustainable design and improvements. Um, it can be driven by local city um, ordinances or requirements. Um, it can be driven by the architect as well. Um, if the building is operating, um, you know, it's an existing building, um, it can be driven by the management team, it can be um, driven by tenant uh, requests. Uh, we really see um, the demand is coming from a variety of stakeholders, you know, and that's one thing great about sustainability is that it, you know, it does help the environment, but it also just makes um, economic and financial sense to ownership. So a lot of these, it sounds like they're kind of a self-sustained type of building or complex. So is that what you find a lot of these are? Uh, oftentimes, that's, that's what you see. And we're headed uh, to a place where more and more buildings will be just like that, net zero buildings that are able to um, operate and use less electricity. The concept of a net zero building takes sustainability to its ultimate goal by generating its own power by way of wind, solar, and geothermal energy. The result is a self-sustaining building that is anticipated to produce energy equal to or greater than it consumes. What's really driving the sustainability movement? It's, it, it's um, in part the public sector and the public really demanding and uh, 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 changes to the built environment to make sure that it's addressing um, a lot of the things that we care about and are concerned, like uh, climate change and what are we going to do about it. Um, but you're also seeing it because um, corporations uh, recognize the economic value of investing in new technologies that make buildings more uh, sustainable. The USGBC, working in concert with many of the building trades and construction industry consultants, strive to make sustainability a comprehensive effort in all stages of construction. 
are opportunities to incorporate sustainable practices into any um, phase of the life of the building. In the design phase of a building, you can start to incorporate um, design features such as um, and focus on building orientation, uh, material selection. During the operational um, phase of the life of a building, you would focus on ensuring that the systems are um, operating as how they were intended to operate, um, as well as focus on um, some of those uh, activities such as everyday cleaning, so making sure that the chemicals and materials that are now being brought into the building are also sustainable as well. There are many factors to consider regarding materials that help qualify a building for a LEED certification. The idea is to begin thinking green in the design phase. You know, the best place to start is at the beginning, so early on in the design phase. Uh, you know, we like to get involved typically in, a, in the schematic design phase of, of the design. Um, that way we can all influence the design components, you know, work with the design team from the architect to mechanical system designer to interior designer, um, but then also have the opportunity to work with contractors and subcontractors um, to ensure that the material selection um, that are being brought in um, are sus considered sustainable. Um, and then we also work with the management team, so the pe people operating the building on a day-to-day -day basis once design and construction is, is finalized. There's a lot of opportunity, uh, especially once you get into the operations of the building as well, because you know you want to commission the space, make sure it's operating the way that it's designed, uh, and you can design a really, a really efficient building on paper. But if the people that are actually running the facility don't know how to use the control systems or sure. don't understand how to work uh, the HVAC equipment, then your everything that you've done is is really pointless. Much thought is given to the durability of the energy systems. This is key to the maintenance and extended life cycle of a building. It makes a big difference, especially when you incorporate some of the, what I like to call the, the softer side of sustainability, where it's the access to natural daylight or, or access to views for your employees. Um, those are all things that you know can reduce your energy efficiency. You know, if you've got more daylight coming into the space, you can reduce your overall lighting load. But it's those little things that really affect your employee morale too. And so it's really a win-win when you combine your design aesthetic with sustainability. A lot of thought goes into the design, and we want to make sure that the uh, materials being selected and the systems being selected um, are being selected for long term. Um, we want to make sure they're the right systems and um, that you're not having to replace those um, you know, a couple years down the road, but it's kind of a long term investment. It may be a higher investment at, at the start, but in the end, um, it'll provide a lot of value to the, to the team. So, so based on that, it, it, we kind of talk about the life cycle and selection of materials. How important does that become into play when doing this process? Sure, so um, we typically see life cycle um, assessments or LCAs as we, we call them um, performed on mechanical systems or lighting systems and also on interior finishes. Um, and it, it is really important. Again, you don't want to be having to tear systems out or materials out shortly after you know the, the um, occupancy of the building. Um, you want them to last. Okay, and that kind of becomes an important factor too. Everybody looks at things that, how they're com made and composed of, whether it's recycled content and things like that, but obviously you really have to look at what the performance of the most materials are and what the lifespan of them would be. Right, absolutely. Um, so it, within the sustainable building movement, um, there are a variety of components um, that go into material selection. As you referenced, um, you can look at recycled content, you can look at where those materials um, are being sourced from, um, are they local, um, if it's wood, is it um, you know, being grown in a sustainably managed forest. Um, all of those components go into the life cycle assessment for a product. Um, so you want to take into consideration a variety of factors before, um, and obviously durability is, is important as well. Um, so you want to take all of those things into consideration when selecting your materials. 
obviously taking all those into consideration, it has a big impact on our environment, and that's kind of what the goal is here. Absolutely. Um, so some big um, ways that, that um, the built environment influences the environment and um, incorporating sustainable practices is reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions through um, energy efficiency initiatives, reducing the amount of waste that, that is going to the landfills um, through recycling construction debris, but also selecting materials with recycled content, and then also reducing the burden on um, our natural resources by utilizing products that have um, those recycled, the recycled content, uh, which reduces the uh, need to extract raw materials. So what would be a good example of, say, a, a corporate entity? Is it mainly uh, the t a freestanding building, office building? How would you, what would be a good example of this being placed? A perfect example is the new Walgreens uh, net zero uh, pharmacy they built in Evanston, Illinois. Um, it's the first one in the world like it. Uh, it uh, is providing really a uh, training ground for Walgreens to learn about new technologies that they're looking to implement in all of their stores all over the world. And that's going to have a huge benefit to them and it's going to have a huge benefit to the environment. It's not just about having a sustainable green building to uh, have cleaner water and fight climate change. It's also about having a space where people can live, work, and learn um, more uh, productively. Having natural light, designing a building so there's more natural light makes people more productive. There's also a big trend right now in thinking about um, how do we make buildings in a way that um, have an impact on our health? How can it help address cancer, obesity, asthma? And all of that can be done in the way that we design our buildings. What products and materials do we use when we're building our buildings? Um, what chemicals are used in those products? Um, how do we make sure that we've got clean air in the buildings and what technologies are needed to make that happen? I think what's really exciting about what's happening in the sustainability movement is it's not being driven just by the private sector or the public sector. It's really happening um, in both places. So you see, for example, here in Illinois, um, the state of Illinois requiring uh, new municipal buildings that are built by the state to be lead rated, to be, to be more sustainable. But you're also seeing corporations that are making it a priority as well, uh, regardless of incentives or requirements coming from, um, from the public sector. And I think that you'll see over time greater and greater um, um, efficiency, sustainable building practices, um, net zero homes, all of that will be coming in the next five to 10 to 15 years. Um, a green sustainable building won't be um, out of the ordinary, it'll be commonplace. Sustainable materials for all stages of construction are readily available. Paul Camozzi is an advocate for sustainable materials and a representative of Amvic Systems, a manufacturer of expanded polystyrene, more commonly known as insulated concrete forms, or ICFs. In terms of sustainability, how do ICFs play a role? That's a real hot spot for me. It's what's given me my passion in the industry for the last 20 years because I'm a past environmental consultant. The number one thing that's going on in the world is reduction of CO2. And if I can reduce energy costs for a building by 50 to 60%, I'm also reducing emissions by the same amount. We have to start building stronger structures, more sustainable structures. And here's one uh, some don't like, but uh, it's not much of a lead platinum structure if it's laying on the ground. We have to get thinking about much stronger ways to build. And with an insulated concrete form, we're good to go. So where do you see the greatest applications of ICF today and kind of become part of uh, future construction? Well, historically, the numbers have been very strong in the northern states because, again, it's been used for concrete forming below grade. But now, as we move to more a resilient society, a stronger society, I truly believe that word resilient will be the next green wave in the United States. So now we're looking at people who are building entire uh, mixed-use applications along coastline, et cetera, in regards to what's happening to high sh wind shear. Uh, hotel, hospitality, adult lifestyle, I've done lots of student dormitories for universities and colleges. 
uh, basically zero maintenance buildings that are very, very uh, uh, strong and uh, quiet and also environmentally friendly. The genius of the insulated concrete form is in its simplicity. It's basically just two expanded polystyrene panels that are held together by a polypropylene web. In most of the manufacturers today, this web is 100% regrain. So right there, about 60% of the weight of this form is a recycled product. One of our challenges is when people want to see an ICF home, uh, it's very difficult to distinguish one from an average home because once they're dressed up with whatever exterior siding you want, they look like a, an average house or commercial building. Uh, we have furring strips that allow you to attach things like hardy plank or a cement board or vinyl siding or brick ties for brick veneer, but also it's a perfect substrate. So what trades are using the ICF? Historically, it was always the carpenters, and I'll tell you how it all came about. Initially, as I mentioned earlier, this was a foundation product. And if you were a carpenter doing maybe one or two homes a year, you had a hard time getting the foundation guys to come out. So something had to change, and some of these professional carpenters said, well, you know what, I'll take full control of the building, and I'll take it from footing up, and I'll control the quality. But more importantly, carpenters understand, uh, they anticipate the other trades coming in, they've learned those various disciplines, and they also understand concrete forming. While the use of synthetic materials for construction has been proven both durable and sustainable, wood remains a natural alternative in the green movement. Archie Landrman, the North Central Regional Director for Woodworks, stopped by the Carpenters Training Center to educate us on wood as a sustainable building material. Sustainability in wood products really go hand in hand because wood is a natural renewable resource, so by nature it's sustainable. There are programs that are put into place to, to govern some of those things, but the simple thing is that wood can be regrown and it's a sustainable product. Woodworks is an initiative of the Wood Products Council. The Wood Products Council is comprised of various member organizations working as a collective voice of advocacy in the wood products industry. We work closely with organizations like FSC, uh, Forest Stewardship Council, SFI, Sustainable, uh, Sustainable Forestry Initiative, and some others that actually certify wood products. So that whole conversation takes part of that. It's, it's an ongoing conversation. And um, because wood is sustainable, it's really pretty easy. Even if we're not talking about certified programs, we're still talking about a sustainable product. We deal mostly with softwoods because those are structural wood products. We're not dealing with typically hardwood products. So I'm speaking more to the softwood side of it. The one that comes to mind that's harder to come by and it's going to be more expensive is redwood. It's still available, but um, it's at a premium because I think there's a, a, a more limited supply of redwood. Redwood takes a long time to mature. Uh, but other than that, the other softwoods like Douglas fir and southern pine, the major structural softwoods, uh, we have them in abundance. Providing stewardship for this natural resource is important with an emphasis on educating both the industry and consumers of wood products. Even though these are soft wood products, they still have the strength and durability to be incorporated into framing. Yeah, it could be a, a roof truss, for instance. It could be a glue laminated beam, it could be a timber, a stud wall. Those are all softwood lumber products. If you talk about a 2x4 or a 2x6 stud, a 2x8, 2x10, 2x12 rafter or joist, that's your basic dimensional type lumber that's used in, in that format. And then of course we do have engineered wood products where we take those and we might take 2x4s and 2x6s and lay them into a glue laminated beam for instance. Or we may take uh, a tree and peel it into veneers and put that back together in the form of a laminated veneer lumber and other products of that nature. So we have dimensional lumber that we can use and we also have engineered wood products. They can be used interchangeably and there's various factors of why we might choose one or the other. An architect 
came up with, I thought it was a very good question. He said, well, if you get us to use all this wood, do we have enough wood? And the answer is, we have more than enough. We annually harvest about 2% of the standing forest inventory, and we grow almost 3% annually. So our growth for almost 100 years has exceeded our harvesting. And by the way, what's interesting, we still have about 70% of the forest area we had when settling became, you know, came to the United States in the 1600s, and Canada has 90% of their uh, of their original forest cover. Whether your construction challenge is commercial or residential structures, we hope that our guests today have helped you build a good foundation for best practices in the construction trades. I'm Bruce Obora. Thank you for watching Built to Last. Visit the Built to Last website to learn about these topics and more.